Okay, let's go ahead and, and return and get started. So it's 1245. We have our third plenary speaker, Brittany Foose, and Leslie Greenlee will be moderating and introducing your presentation briefly. So we'll turn it over to Leslie. Thank you. Hello, how's everybody? Thank you, everybody, for coming to this great conference. Okay. Um, Brittany Foos, she's an ESL coordinator at the Literacy and Learning Center, which is a part of the Literacy Council of Lan Lancaster, Lebanon. Um, this center, they created the Inter International Health Professionals Program, which is known as IHPP, to assist health professionals from other countries establish a healthcare career in, in the United States by learning the English skills and then developing other credentials. The training program, it's an intensive medical English class and several of the students uh, enrolled in Penn State Harrisburg second degree RN program. Now at this literacy and learning success center, Brittany works with adults, uh, mostly refugees and immigrants. She's also worked with students of all age groups in the past. In addition, Brittany um, has been employed at many colleges, university, and community organizations. Some of these include Harrisburg Area Community College, Interactive College of Technology, CCB School of Atlanta, and she's also taught in India and developed curriculum for a nonprofit in Turkey and taught and created curriculum for a safe house for female refugees in Greece. And to, presently, she is also uh, an adult education coordinator at the Equity Institutes of, of Race Conscious Pedagogy. So she has interests in traveling, eating spicy food, and hiking. So for the last 15 minutes, again, we're going to have the questions. Um, if you could write down all your questions till that point, and then you, know, you can raise your hand and you can ask the questions at the end. Um, and then at the very end, we're going to have another raffle again for the free memberships. Okay, thank you. All right, now it's up to Brittany. Thank you. I always forget to unmute myself. My students know that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brittany Foos. Um, again, I'm part of the Literacy Council of Lancaster, Lebanon. Um, and I'm here to introduce you to the International Health Professionals Program. This is a program that I'm very, very excited about. Um, I'm also just feel so honored to be able to work with this group of students. Um, I've been around a lot of students and these are perhaps by far the most, um, most dedicated and persistent. All right, so um, let's see. Oh, I got it. There we go. Um, so our overview, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the origins of our program. Um, and then we'll follow up with the student pathways, um, also talking about our initial challenges and response, um, then talking um, about the challenges created by COVID-19 um, and how we uh, went along with that. I'll take a brief look at the curriculum and then I just want to tell you about our successes. Um, so this is um, a video that was actually created by um, the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Um, we won one of their Pennsylvania Medical Society innovative innovation grants. Um, so they were kind enough to come around and um, create this five minute video for us. Um, you will see some familiar faces. You'll see faces of different students. Um, and I just think it's a really good overview. So I'm gonna play this. Please let me know if it's not working correctly. All right. So, can you see the video? Those emotions, they were put on hold by time, but it clears right away. We, we, can't right. See the, we can't see the video. You just probably have to stop sharing and reshare with that okay. page up. Thank you. Yes. All right. There we go. 
again, my students know that I have this tendency. <laughs> All right, so here's our video. It's about five minutes, but I think it's well worth the watch. We have no sound. Yeah, summer of 2006. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. You have it now. Sorry, right. I didn't. There must not have been any prior. <laughs> no problem. Make sure. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, here we go. Um, this is a face to keep an eye on, by the way, Dr. Daniel Weber. Was a simple, naive, but a beautiful idea, and it was our medical ESL program. The Literacy Council does an exceptional job here in Lancaster of helping people to begin to learn a language or to improve English. We started with just two or four doctors and they were all from Cuba. We now have physicians or healthcare professionals from other countries, Ethiopia, Poland, Germany, Brazil, Democratic Republic of Congo, and I could go on to have us together in a room talking medicine. Even though we may be struggling in English, we're not struggling in the other language that the doctors all speak or the nurses all speak, and that's medicine. Just say, hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide. Now just say hydrochlorothiazide. When we sing, it makes it so much easier to be able to speak more clearly. There's a lot of work behind this. There's a lot of volunteers who are helping us in, in a very good way. They are not only helping us with the English, and they are taking care of us as a family, a very big welcome. It's not only us here, it's our family involved too in the program. So have a tutor who working with us uh, online. When we participate together, for example, in my case with my, with my son. When we started that program, Every one of the doctors came in with their head down and they would whisper and they would say, I was a doctor in Cuba and now I'm in a factory. I came and I'm sorry, working in a factory to, to be able to pay bills and do something with my life. And this program it was a huge change. Right now I'm running for a bachelor degree in Penn State College, which is something unbelievable. I'm still I'm still dreaming with that sometimes. I'd say, is this real? <laughs> Within three or four sessions, when somebody new came to join us, that person would walk in, we do the introductions. That person would say, hi, I was a doctor in Cuba. And all the other members of the class would turn around and say, you still are a doctor. In order for us to excel in this program, we branched out even further. The relationship that we have with Hershey Medical Center's simulation lab permits the doctors to be studying and to re be reviewing basic areas of medicine to get uh, advanced life support certification uh, and to be able to feel comfortable in a clinical scenario again. The Penn State University Dickinson School of Law is phenomenal. Dr. McLuth is an immigration <laughs> law specialist and she's working with us now that our doctors are getting ready to apply for citizenship. There are only 5,000 nationally certified Spanish English medical interpreters in the United States. 10 of the doctors and two of us have now completed a 100 hour course. To be able to go to a hospital and to be a trained medical interpreter, our international healthcare professionals will once again be on the front lines of medicine. We can also pay back to the community working here in Lancaster with the Spanish population have been growing up a lot. And now we are able to interpret for them. We could not have done that without the Pennsylvania Medical Society grant. It helped pay for the tuition. In the meantime, do you know that phrase? In the meantime, mm -hmm. while everything else is going on, in the meantime. The Literacy Council, with the help of Pennsylvania Medical Society's new grant, we now have a three hour class once a week that is going back to the basics of English structure, keeping in mind that Brittany is teaching healthcare professionals from other countries. We now have a program within Lancaster Health where our physicians who are Spanish and now new English speakers are teaching a medical Spanish class 
for their nurses and doctors in the evenings. In order to learn a new language, it really helps to believe in yourself again. So what the doctors told me is that this class, which looked like a medical ESL class, was food for the soul. They want to live as best they can the American dream, and they're just so, so ready to give back to their community. Ah, let's see if I can get this to stop. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I think that gives a pretty good overview um, of what our program's about. Oh, no. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so our origins, um, what you just saw, um, the person that was talking for the most part, that's Dr. Daniel Weber. Um, and so it was inspired by his trip as a guest lecturer for FNM College um, in May and June 2016. Um, when they went to Cuba, um, they were focusing on Cuba's health policies, um, both nationally and internationally. Um, they visited clinics and he had a lot of opportunities to talk to physicians there. Um, he also learned about the Cuban Medical Professional Parole Program. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it was a program instated by President Bush in 2006, I'm sorry, 2006, um, and it went until um, January 2017. So in this program, um, if you're not familiar, um, Cuban doctors are sent all throughout the world um, in service. Um, and, you know, during the Ebola crisis, they were some of the people on the very front line. Um, going to Venezuela, I've had doctors who came from working in Col uh, Colombia, Brazil. Well, there's U.S. embassies all in most of those countries. So um, through the Cuban Medical Professional Parole Program, a Cuban doctor who is working in a country with a U.S. embassy, if they went to the U.S. embassy and they showed proof of being a medical professional, we would issue them a temporary visa. Um, now, what, it's different from refugee resettlement where the, they didn't really help with the process. There was no money given, no grants, no um, loan that they had to pay back. They just were able to get themselves there within that period of time. Um, and through ORR, um, sorry, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, um, there were 11 cities that would resettle these parolees. Um, and Lancaster, Pennsylvania happens to be one of 11. Um, so finding out all of this, ex you know, through his experience and finding out, oh, I live in Lancaster, um, you know, I, I'm guest lecturing for FNM College, I'm an alumni there. Um, he realized, oh, this is a, a great opportunity. Let's fuse all of these together. Um, so he came right back. Um, and so he partnered with Literacy Council in July, 2016. Um, and this is because he realized, oh, um, a big part of this is that they need English. Um, so the goal was to get, uh, initially to get Cuban doctors, um, medical professionals, integrated into the American health care system. Um, and so it was there to support and empower Cuban medical professionals in their journey. Um, one of the unfortunate things that would happen is um, many of the doctors um, in talking to them did not realize that yes, Lancaster is a welcoming place, but your credentials don't transfer over. Um, so you can be a medical doctor in Cuba and then come back over and your credentials mean basically nothing. It's a piece of paper. Um, so um, a lot of them come over um, and like you saw um, Ovis, um, if you saw him um, talking, he, he worked in a factory for a while. Um, a, lot of, a lot of our um, doctors and medical professionals come here and they start working in a factory. Um, so it was a matter of building up their confidence and as well as building up their English and um, allowing them to get those credentials that they need to be able to, to practice and to um, be able to work in something they're passionate about. Um, so 
over the five years that we've worked through this, um, we've realized that there's some different paths back to the, the medical field. Um, so the first two, path one and path two, are what I'm going to be mostly talking about today. Um, but you have path one where they return as a physician. Um, and in order to do that, they have to pass all the step exams of the USMLE, which is the United States Medical Licensing Exam. But I'll be using USMLE um, during this presentation. Um, after they pass all those exams, they have to match for residency. Path two, um, which was developed in 2019, um, was to achieve um, a registered nurse and to pass the NCLEX, um, but to also get a bachelor's of science in nursing at Penn State Harrisburg. Um, the third path was to become a, a medical assist assistant. Whoops. Uh, path four was to become a medical interpreter. And path five is fairly complicated, uh, but you would become an RN. First, you would relocate to Florida. Then you would go to um, Puerto Rico and study at a school that's certified there, but is in Spanish. So then you'd go back to Florida and you'd pass the NCLEX in Florida. After that, you would return to Lancaster if you wanted and um, you'd have to, that would transfer, but you'd have to take the TOEFL on um, as well as part of the requirements. So again, we're looking at path one and path two during this presentation. Um, so I was brought in in October of 2019, um, initially with students that were at Penn State University Harrisburg. Um, so they were in the program there in the second degree um, bachelor's of science and nursing program. So I came in and there were three major challenges that I found. Um, the first one was the one I knew about. It was their academic struggles. Um, they made it into the program. The problem is, is if they didn't realize that they didn't have all of the English skills they needed. And that was really disappointing to a lot of them. And um, it kind of caused a cycle where the more you would get nervous about not passing your classes, the worst you would, the worst you would do on a test. Um, so there was a lot of high effective factors there. Um, so we had, you know, I came in again, part, uh, part of the way through a semester um, with a couple of students in danger of failing. Um, the areas of weakness that I was noticing among students was, um, I think all six of them came up to me and said, man, listening to a lecture and taking notes at the same time is killing me. This is awful. Um, it's really hard. I, I don't, I, I'm missing valuable parts of the lecture because of this. Um, so that was probably one of the biggest issues. Um, then it came down to lack of academic and medical vocabulary. And when I mean medical vocabulary, it's not the, the large terms that, um, that are used you know, for illnesses and for muscles and things like that. It was, um, I remember one of the students um, couldn't answer a test question because they didn't know what crutches were. So it was medical, it was more medical equipment. Um, they also just struggled with certain academic words, uh, maybe more of your words that if you had taken the SAT or taken a GRE, words that you'd be familiar with in those cases. Um, also writing, oh man, um, I looked at some of it and it was comma splices galore. Um, so it was try things like that, just trying to get them to, to use periods or um, knowing when to make a paragraph. Um, it's just, it's different um, transitioning from writing in Spanish to writing in English. Um, you know, and getting them to understand the importance of editing. Um, we also had some issues with their just clear spoken communication. Um, some of the students um, had stronger accents than others. Um, and I always told them it's not about accent reduction. It's, it is about um, learning pronunciation that helps for clear communication. So we did have problems with that. Um, you know, um, one example that was kind of funny, what, but was in front of a bunch of um, 
in front of a class actually involved um, um, a sad use of a, a, a swear word actually, because they um, thought that they were saying cheating and they said something else. Um, thankfully they had a good sense of humor, but it's things like that, man, you can really get yourself into some trouble like that. Um, so, you know, those were things that we really started having to work on. Um, another issue that I wasn't expecting was test taking skills. Um, I was being told by the students and by the instructors actually that um, students were struggling to understand the concept of, of, of a multiple choice question. Um, I wasn't expecting that because you go into this thinking, hey, you're medical doctors, you have, you're very good at taking exams, you're very good at time management, you're good at, um, you know, knowing what, that you have to read and being able to, you just have a high level of, of academic background already. So finding out, oh, we've got to go to the basics of um, practicing a test taking skill. Okay, that was that was a challenge. Um, the next one was professors who were unfamiliar with teaching for English language learners. Um, so this is out of no fault of theirs, um, but things that we were complaints of students were that um, some of their lecture methods were inconducive to their success. Um, for instance, you uh, they would talk to the whiteboard, not realizing it. Um, and so it would be quiet, it was hard to hear. Um, walking around the classroom and talking. Again, it gets your students up and motivated, um, paying attention a bit more. But if you're sitting in the front in hopes of hearing the, the instructor better, that, was, that wasn't going to work for you. Um, you also have different professors. So uh, we had some that spoke at a, a nice solid speed. Um, their volume was loud. You have other professors that they just, they would talk at a low speed and very fast. There was one in particular that I even had a hard time understanding at times. Um, another one was using idioms and slang. Um, you don't realize it, but um, things that you might say to try to, to be funny to your, your students and to try to you know, get on their level, um, you'd end up using slang that they didn't understand or using idioms. Um, for instance, um, pale as a ghost, no idea. I had, I had to explain that one for a couple of minutes. Um, other, the other thing is um, referencing unfamiliar American events or people and doing it in a very quick way. Um, there was um, an assignment that I was sitting in on that talked about the civil rights movement. So um, they were talking about Rosa Parks. Well, <laughs> who's Rosa Parks? Um, so, you know, I'd, you'd either have to quickly explain that or just tell them, you know, we're going to have to spend some extra time looking this up, you know? Um, so those were things that um, were difficult for them to understand in the classroom. Again, professors were just teaching the way that they would normally teach. So this is no fault of their own. Um, and then the third challenge was balancing their priorities. Um, there were students that had very many, a lot of roles. So, um, you know, there's adults with responsibilities. They have mortgage, mortgages or rent that they have to pay. They have different bills. Um, they might have children. They might have, um, you know, a spouse. They might have a partner that they were with. And all of these, you know, there's responsibilities. You can't just, you know, you can't just not tend to those. Um, there were other ones that were employees. So some of the students were working, others were not. But the students that were working, um, you know, additional hours to be able to pay rent or something like that, you, you could tell they were very tired. Um, they just didn't have a lot of extra time. They were going from class to, cl uh, you know, class to, um, to work. Um, and then just um, also balancing the role of a student in the, their second language. So not only were they a student, um, you know, pursuing a degree, even if it is something that they're familiar with, 
Um, but you have all the assignments, you have, um, you know, all the reading and everything you have to do. And there's that additional layer of it being in a different language, a language that you're familiar with, but there's still nuances that are going to make it take more time for you to be able to successfully complete the assignment. Um, so the responses. So the first was classroom support. Um, so that's where I came in. Um, I was embedded ESL support in the classroom. So I would go to their lectures. Um, I would sit in there and, you know, sometimes I was just taking notes and listening. Oh, that's a, that's a word they're going to need to review later. Um, oh, I need to ask them later if they understood that concept. Um, I also had access to Canvas, which allowed me to see what their assignments were going to look like um, and try to plan ahead a material that they might need to review beforehand. Um, I also was able to go in for exams and not necessarily help them. Um, I am not helpful when it comes to medical knowledge at all. I am helpful if you don't know, again, a word like crutches. I can help explain that. And so um, we worked out a system where that was okay. Um, if I wasn't able to be there, they would have a dictionary um, available. Um, we also had tutoring. So sometimes that was me, but we also had a lot of other wonderful, um, you know, volunteer tutors that were working one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, I was also there for editing. So um, they could send me assignments and I would look over them and edit them for them um, and, you know, figure out what the issues were so I could possibly do a quick lesson on it later. Um, response two was as a liaison. So um, because I was going to Penn State Harrisburg once a week, sometimes twice, sometimes three times, <laughs> um, it was consistent staff interaction. I kind of had a pulse, a finger to the pulse of what was happening, um, which students were struggling, um, what assignments were coming up, um, uh, what clinicals were going to look like. Um, I also had the opportunity um, to provide some guidance to the professors on working with English language learners. Yes, they came across some um, during their study, you know, during their tenure, but um, they often didn't have, they didn't have a large cohort like they did. Um, so some of them decided to take the, uh, the, you know, the opportunity to have someone sit in on class and to actually tell them, hey, you know, you're pointing and you're just moving your hand and it's not actually pointing at the material that you want them to look at. Like that's distracting and that's confusing. Or, oh, you walk around the room. Um, I get why you do that, but consider that there's students that wanted to sit in the front for a specific reason. Um, so things like that. Um, also just the opportunity to work together for the student success, you know, um, we all kind of had that in mind where we wanted them to be successful and we wanted them um, to pass classes. And so, um, you know, just working together and seeing how we can make that happen. Also advocating for students when necessary. Um, if that was, hey, you know, um, again, like getting them some additional support for the exam. And that was through... Um, through some of us advocating for the students to have that. All right, and then response number three was intentional instruction. Came in thinking, oh yeah, this is gonna be like an additional little class for them. Came in and that was their worst nightmare. They did not, <laughs> they just, they didn't have time. Um, I didn't realize how busy their schedules were. Um, and trying to put an additional activity on them, even when it, in the long run, it would be helpful. They just, <clears throat> they didn't have time for it, they felt. And so it was a very difficult, um, it was kind of a difficult sell. So what I ended up doing is I thought, okay, how can I make this work for them? So what I decided was that we were going to have lunch break meetings um, it was going to be targeted areas of instruction. So as much as I might want to go through all the different verb tenses or all the, you know, and have a nice little curriculum that way, we kind of just had to go with, 
hey, comma splices, we've been messing, you know, we've been having problems with these, you know, here's five minutes, listen to me, talk about comma splices, do this quick activity. Um, we'd, I'd also do short exercises. Um, if you're familiar with the website Everyday Edits, that was wonderful because you have those, um, you have a paragraph, it's 10 mistakes usually, um, you have to find them, it's editing, which a lot of students needed some revision on. Um, also, um, you know, getting them to look at different vocabulary. Um, the way I would do that is through sending daily emails with vocabulary. So it'd normally be a list of between eight to 10 words. Um, sometimes it was after having sat in a lecture and realizing, okay, I didn't have a chance to talk with these students afterwards. I want them to know these things that I just heard. Or um, I was also going through NCLEX practice questions and just looking and seeing, okay, that's an academic word they might not know, or this was part of a scenario that they might not be familiar with. Um, I wouldn't put the definitions down. I would just give them the words and I told them to look through them. If you know what the word is, I'm not going to have you waste your time looking at that word. But if you're not familiar with it, I need, you know, take some initiative, look it up. And if you have extra questions, let me know. Um, they seem to like those and those worked pretty well. Um, so we continued on with those for a while. And again, it's just this asking for student input. How could I actually be helpful to them instead of, again, making just being one more thing added to their pile, even in my best attempts to help? So that was all. We were figuring everything out. Um, and oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, the other thing that I was doing for intentional instruction was preparation for the next cohort. I didn't have this opportunity before. Um, but what we were hoping to do is to mitigate some of the issues that we noticed. Um, so preparing um, for the next cohort with an in-person class um, focused on academic success at Penn State University. Um, you know, we were working through medical, English, um, a specific textbook, actually. It's kind of one of my best friends right now. It's a medical English clear and simple, and I'll have this in the resource list for you, but this is wonderful. Um, it's specifically for um, American and Canadian um, professionals who are hoping to learn medical English. So they are, most of them, they should have the, the basis behind the material, maybe, in, but in a different language. They just need revision and they need to know what the different vocabulary words um, and you know the grammar and phrases and everything associated with it. Um, so actually in the video, if you saw me teaching, um, that was that particular group. Um, we were actually, we also did a lot of pronunciation. So uh, we were practicing that TH sound that's really difficult. Um, so that was something else we were working on. Um, I would give independent writing activities for them to do outside of class. So yeah, we had a whole system going on um, and then COVID hit. And actually it was really interesting because one of the classes I was sitting in for Penn State Harrisburg um, actually was a community health class and they had just done a pandemic game simulation like a couple of weeks ahead of time. So it was really bizarre <laughs> to all of a sudden, oh, this isn't a simulation, this is real life. So everything changed. Um, I had to adapt the program from in-person to online. That was all aspects of it. Um, and then I had to modify the instructional objective from Penn State University academic success to also include preparation for the OET and TOEFL. Um, and I'll get to those acronyms in a little bit. Um, the first one was adapting the program. So for the in-person support aspect, um, it went from them having classes on Zoom and me trying to get into Zoom classes and uh, be able to sit in there with them. Um, we kept up through emails and WhatsApp. Um, again, me sending them exercises, um, sending them those daily um, vocabulary lists and different little exercises like an everyday edit. Um, I also had a Zoom office hour or two, yeah. Um, 
So Zoom office hours where I was available once a week, anybody could drop in and we could just um, discuss or work on whatever they wanted. Um, they were able to continue having me um, edit their papers any, and um, continue to ask for support. For my preparation class, um, realized that there was a lot of issues going on between their schedules. Um, most of my students worked in the healthcare field, um, mostly as CNAs or medical assistants, but almost all of them were in retirement homes. Um, so they were getting slammed with extra hours. On top of that, most of them caught COVID. Um, so we had to deal with the, the stresses and situations that came along with that. Um, then we came along with, I had to modify the instructional objective. So um, that first pathway that we talked about where you could become a physician, it's a long and time consuming um, process. And that process is called the USMLE, again, the United States Medical Licensing Exam. And so they've had this going for a long time. Um, they, so normally it's a step one exam and that's kind of like their weed out exam, if I remember correctly, that's um, it's a lot of clinical information. Um, and the step two, after they pass that, it's clinical knowledge. So they normally call it the step two CK. So that remained the same. The problem was, is that the step two clinical skills or CS, that was actually like an interaction um, where you would go and simulate being a medical professional. You couldn't do that, not with COVID. Um, so they realized, oh, well, we still need to have some sort of level of somebody's English proficiency. So first they were looking at the TOEFL. Um, but then, um, so we started working towards that and then found out that actually, oh, it's the occupational English test, which I'm going to be talking a lot about. And that's um, in short is the OET. So the OET, just for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's an English language test specifically for healthcare profession uh, professionals. You have it for doctors, you have it for nurses, dentists, um, Let's see, I've seen dietitians, um, physical therapists, like I think there's 12 different pathways you could take. However, what they do have in common is that they all have the same, the same um, components, the listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Um, so what I'm kind of going to be, um, oh, I'm sorry. So we're looking at the curriculum development and implementation. So what I had to do is I had to take students that were preparing for Penn State, um, the Penn State uh, second degree RN program, and also work on preparing students for OET success. So I kind of started to break it down again into those four parts because yes, they're different, they're different actual things, but they have a lot of the same objectives. So for listening, um, so we would go through and do activities about taking notes while listening. Um, for, the, uh, for those students going to Penn State, they just had to learn how to do that for in class. Um, for students taking the OET, they actually had to learn how to do that for one of the, the part A of um, section, of the listening section, which was a consultation extract. Um, so basically you would be listening as a physician was doing a consultation with a patient and they would have uh, almost like a note sheet and have to take specific notes. Um, so those were very similar. So I started doing activities based off of somebody listening and having to almost either fill in the blank or take just take notes where it was specific information. Um, then we had gathering information from daily conversation. Um, that was a consistent thing that you have to do just in general um, for your um, students who are planning on becoming nurses. Um, they just had to be able to constantly do it. The way students, um, I'm sorry, the way candidates for the um, USMLE, the way that they would prove that they were able to gather information from these conversations was in part B, it was short workplace extracts. 
for the for those of you that are familiar with the TOEFL, it's very similar to those um, those parts in the listening where you have um, a conversation between you know someone in the academic world and a student, and you have to listen and you're able you have to know um, the information or be able to answer the question. It's very similar to that. Um, the last part, the last concept that we needed to to work through for the listening was then comprehending an academic lecture. Um, again, you need to be able to do that in class. Doesn't matter where you're going to school. Um, but then for those going to the OE, um, practicing for the OET, that was for part C, and that was a presentation extract. So they were listening to, um, it was either, um, you know, a lecture for um, continuing development, um, continuing professional development, or, um, you know, research. And so they would have to listen um, to a couple minute long academic lecture and be able to correctly answer the questions. So, um, Taking notes while listening and comprehending an academic lecture honestly went kind of hand in hand. Um, what we've been doing a lot of is, in addition to practice materials I found for the OET, um, we've also been doing a lot of TED Talks. Um, so we've been doing a lot of listening to TED Talks, and I'll have it, you know, I'll have um, created an activity around it, and they'll have to be able to um, answer questions or fill in the notes, depending on what we're doing that day. Um, also, um, for gathering information from daily conversations, um, we used a site called Ello. I'm actually not sure exactly how you'd say it, but it's E-L-L-L-O. So Ello is my best guess. Um, and I'll have that on the resources as well. They have daily conversations and you can listen to it and then um, it'll have a quiz for you afterwards. So that was a really useful way of me um, not having to find too many different conversations or having to, you know, record with my roommate different questions, uh, different conversations. So um, that was a way of finding that. Oh, one other thing I think that's of note for the listening section for the OET is that they're required to listen and be able to um, answer questions about any accent. So it's not just an American accent, it's a, a Canadian, Australian and British accents as well. Um, so I kind of had to bear that in mind when I was creating um, listening activities and maybe you know splitting people up into groups um, about, you know, for those um, who are taking, uh, who are preparing for Penn State, that might not be as useful for them. All right, um, then we had, the next part was the speaking. So again, looking at speaking needs for both of these groups, you need clear communication with others. So that's for Penn State students, that was interactions with classmates, faculty and staff. Sorry, just checking my time. Um, you also had to be able to do it during clinicals. Um, the OET had two role plays that you would have to do either with a potential patient um, or, yeah, it was usually with a patient if I remember correctly, actually, yeah. So you'd be doing two role plays with patients. Um, outside of the classroom, you'd have to, I found it was very interesting, um, you have, students who need all types of English. They don't just need academic English. They also need the slang and idioms for interacting with their coworkers and with patients. Um, for instance, we had to talk, um, students would ask me questions. And so we'd have to talk through the different ways of saying that you were angry um, from, as, from polite to completely rude because they had, um, you know, they had had an interaction with a coworker where they said um, rudely that they were angry. So we had to realize, okay, there's different ways of saying that. Also body parts. There are so many different ways of saying a body part. And so getting used to the fact that someone might say, you know, instead of um, their mouth, they might, you know, where I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of, um, you know, for like their bottom, they might say, butt, or they might say, 
um, gluteus maximus. So you had to get familiar with those kind of things. You also do need the academic English for those professional interactions though. And then the last part, since I know we're running out of time, was they had to learn efficient reading. Um, so for, um, again, for Penn State students, they had to learn how to do this daily. OET students would do this um, through the part one. There was a speed reading task, 20 minutes, 20 questions. Um, and then reading comprehension. Um, for Penn State students, they needed to know informative and opinion um, and how to read for, uh, for information and how to read for opinions and um, gist and all of those things within um, their textbook or whatever reading material they were given. The OET had um, reading part two and part three. They were both careful reading tasks, but they were sourced from um, one was sourced from workplace texts um, and more informative, and then the other two were academic tasks and focusing more on details and opinion. Um, and then the last part was the writing. Um, and so for both of them, they just needed task-based writing, um, whether it was academic writing assignments or for the OET, they needed to be able to write a letter, usually, usually a referral letter. So, you know, teaching all of them about formatting, about conventions, grammar, it was all important. It just takes a different form. Um, here are some statistics that you can read through, or I'll read them for us too. Um, these are our successes. So we've had almost 100 medical professional participants. Um, now, I've talked a lot about Cuba, but we actually have 14 different countries and 23 different, uh, different languages. Um, we just had our first cohort um, graduate. So we had six RN BSN graduates from Penn State University Harrisburg. Um, we have seven students currently enrolled. Um, and then we have seven students accepted and five students waitlisted for the new August, 2021 cohort. Um, this part's really exciting for me. We just had one physician who was made it through the whole USMLE exam process, and he actually just matched and got accepted into a residency. Um, then we have three physicians who have passed through the USMLE exams and the OET, and they'll be joining the match, um, hopefully getting a residency soon. We have 10 certified medical assistants and 10 students who passed a 100 hour medical interpreter course. So I think I finished almost in time. Do you have any questions? I was asking, um, do most of them pass the OET the first time? Um, so I've had some students pass through it the first time. Um, I had one student who passed all but one section the first time and then passed through the second time. And what do they have to get to pass uh, each section? Is it an 80% or? Um, so there's different bands. It's a little different. Um, they have to pass through the B band. So it's, mm -hmm. it's essentially about an 80%. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm just looking through. Um, okay, so the first question I'm looking through. Oh yeah, Arlene, um, Arlen, the childcare schedules and costs, that was definitely an issue. Um, and trying to, we had two students who were married that wanted to participate, if, to, I'm sorry, participate at the same time and it just became pretty difficult. Um, and then let's see, um, I'm looking through. Oh, Melissa, I saw that. Um, Linda, I do not, this is a kind of a very unique program. We do not have this in Japan um, that I know of. Our hope is to start reaching out to other communities um, in hopes that other medical professionals who are unemployed or underemployed are able to be able to um, to be able to integrate into the medical professional world. 
Hi, how Leslie. long does this uh, to get the license? About how long do you think it could take the whole process? You know, it's a long. It is a long process, and that's why some of the students decided um, and changed their mind to go into the BSRN program because um, they realized, okay, that's a sixteen month. Um, that's a sixteen month commitment. And then you have to take the NCLEX and find a job. Whereas for the USMLE, um, I've known students that have been working at it since 2015. I've known wow. some, I've known students um, who really, you know, they life happened and they had to put it on hold for a bit. Um, I talked to a student who was working 40 hours a week and then would wake up at one in the morning and study from one until five and then go to go to work afterwards, pick up her kids, go to bed at like eight or nine. So um, it's it just depends on um, how long and how much time you have available. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ar Arlen, I see your hand raised. Yeah, just a quick question. So you mentioned something about um, people working in nursing homes and CNAs. Um, so would you recommend this program for people who want to become a CNA or become uh, an HHA or it's beyond that level? I would say it's beyond that level because there are more CNA programs out there. Right. That, um, at least in our area, there are CNA programs um, that often have an English language component to it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this, uh, for this particular program, we have more, um, it's a bit more embedded and hoping to get physicians back into being either physicians or getting back into, um, you know, being a nurse or something. So, so different. studying for the OET would be something you would do maybe after that level, correct? Yeah. So like becoming a lot of these students, um, I made it look a bit more linear than it actually, like I made it look a bit more spread out than it actually is. It's actually usually a bit kind of linear and like, for instance, they might become a CNA first or they might become a, a medical assistant first. And then um, through working and those experiences either decide to go to be, um, go for the USMLE or decide to go to um, the, the RN program. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, I hope I answered that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going back down then through, so let's see. Um, oh, the list of countries. Um, so when I say the list of countries, I mean the countries that the physicians are from. Um, so I'm not sure um, exactly what they are, but I'd be, very happy to look that up for you. Um, let's see, Stephanie, um, how many teachers um, at the Literacy Council support this program? So I'm kind of the lead on it. Um, we have a volunteer um, coordinator who helps a lot with this. Um, we have um, another program that um, we have a grant with called Career Pathways for English language learners. And so a lot of those students are involved in that program too. Um, so we have another person um, that he takes the lead of that program. So I would say it's probably plus, you know, our leadership. Um, so we have Cheryl Heaster and we have Jenny Baer um, along with our board of directors. So I would say it's a collaborative, a collaborative, you know, team uh, working together. Um, so, and then what does it take for an instructor to become comfortable working with a population like this? Um, I mean, for me, it's just been a variety of experiences, um, especially in the classroom and just figuring out um, what works for learning a language and what doesn't. I think also uh, my history of not staying in the country all the time and um, traveling and um, teaching and de developing curriculum other places. I think learning what it feels like to know that I have professional experience and know that I'm an intelligent person and, and, it, and here in the United States, I'm an independent person and then realize that you can go to a different country and that's 
not what people see you as, and that's not how you're able to interact on your daily in your daily life. So I think once you can put yourself in that mindset and you have the professional experience, I think that's what kind of builds that comfort. Um, Arlen, I see another question. No, I'm sorry, I forgot to take my hand oh. down. I'll do that. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, yeah, no problem. Um, so again, if anybody else, oh, so if anybody else has questions, um, I put my email up here. Um, so Brittany at literacysuccess.org. I'd be more than happy to, um, you know, explain any any questions that you have. Um, I am planning when I send out this list, I'll be sending out um, some resources too of activities that I found were useful. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have a time the time to really go into exactly what an activity would look like. 